Praise the Lord. Last week, we started a, a, a message, and I told you last week that we would, uh, in, this message, in this series of messages, we're going to talk about uh, strongholds, what it means to be engaged in the struggle, the battle against the enemy. We're going to talk about the battleground today and over the course of the next seven weeks, if the Lord permits, because one of the things that I was even studying for this message and preparing for this first uh, message on the battlefield uh, the battleground, uh, I don't want to rush through it, and I don't want to preach two hours just to get through a, a sermon. So if I have to stop and have a part two, then we'll do that. But we're going to see the Lord see us through this. But we want to take the time to really lay out a foundation for what it means to be a good soldier, a faithful soldier. Paul told Timothy to fight the good fight, right? He told him to be a good soldier, and, uh, and so that's what we've been called to do. We, we're not only sons of God and daughters of God. We're not only servants of the Lord, but we're also part of an army. And we're called to be engaged in this, in this struggle. But we need to be fully equipped. And a good soldier is fully equipped. A good soldier is trained. And I think what happens oftentimes in the church, and I can even say this about my own ministry life, that I haven't always done the, the best job at fully equipping those that God has given me to, to, to pour into. He said he gave him some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And so we've been called to, to, uh, to, to know the word of God, but we've also as ministry leaders been called to equip others to do the work, to be engaged in the work. And so it's important that we teach the word of God. One of the things that we value around here is the word of God. And it's our, and it's our desire to do it with... Uh, to, to teach with excellence, but also to teach, uh, you know, to teach the word of God, rightly divide the word of truth. And so we don't want to do anything by the manipulation or, or control. We want to make sure when we're teaching and preaching the word, we're doing it accurately as the spirit gives us understanding. There's much in the scripture that, that people interpret differently. And so we want, to in, we want to let the Holy Spirit, he's the interpreter. Commentators are good and authors are good. And we're actually going to utilize uh, some material from a, a specific um, book and, and author that I think is really sound in his, in his teaching and doctrine. But, uh, but we need to let the Holy Spirit be the interpreter. And so he will interpret these things for us. And so if we just engage, if we, if we engage the Lord and we, and we have, let me go back and say this. My mind is like, there's like a thousand things like, and I got to get my focus here, but the word of God is what we really value. And we hold high, high value on the word of God. And so we, we try to develop things and teach the word of God in, so that God's people can grow and can learn. I know in my own life, in my early years of my life, in the early stages of my life, sound biblical teaching is what set my foundation, helped me get my feet on, a, on the firm foundation, which is Christ, and helped me to grow in my life. You have to have a good foundation if you're going to start out. And what is the, what's your foundation? It's the Word of God. What's your, what's your filter for life? The Word of God. What's the lens in which you look through? It should be the Word of God. If you don't have a Christian worldview, if you don't have a biblical worldview, then, you're, then you have a skewed worldview, it's a, and it's, it's going to get you in trouble. But man, if you start from there, then the Lord will just teach you, and he'll grow you. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So I want to get into it. We're going to talk today, and we're going to start today's message off talking about the battleground of the mind. That's the first uh, thing we're going to talk about. We're going to spend some time laying that out. In the course of this series of messages, we'll talk about strongholds. And we're going to talk about the good strongholds and the bad strongholds. There are good strongholds in the word. There's not just, but we think of strongholds, we think automatically of the negative, of the enemy. You know, the Bible says to tear down every stronghold that exalts itself against the knowledge of Jesus. And that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to God for the pulling down of strongholds. And so, but we also know that the Lord is a stronghold. The Bible says the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into him and are saved. And so uh, the church is a stronghold. We'll learn a little bit about that down the road. But, but today I want to talk about the battlefield of the mind. Um, the resource that we've, we've chosen to kind of help us uh, in this is uh, a book called The Three Battlegrounds. And uh, Pastor Francis Frangipan is the author. I meant to have a slide up here, and I apologize about that. And, and we maybe even try, if you're interested in the book, we can tell you how to get that book. This would be a great resource to go along with us in. But he writes this in the book. He says, the location where Jesus was crucified was called Golgotha, which meant place of the skull. If we'll be effective in spiritual warfare, the first field of conflict where we must learn warfare is the battleground of the mind, the place of the skull. 
For the territory of the uncrucified thought life is the, breached, is the beachhead of satanic assault in our lives. Let me just say that again. The territory of the uncrucified thought life is the beachhead of satanic assault in our, to, in our lives. To, the defeat, to defeat the devil, we must be renewed in the spirit of our minds. We have to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul's writing this verse, very familiar passage, and he says, we're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we're not to be conformed, which means to assimilate to, to become behaviorally or socially similar to. We're not to be like the world, but we're called to come out from the world and be a separated people. We're called to be different than the world. We should be distinctively, distinctively different from the world. People should be able to see our lives and be able to mark us as different. Amen. And then he says, but not only do not to be conformed to this world or this evil age, its values, its beliefs, its morals, in distinction to God, in, dis, in distinction to God's, but we're to be transformed, which literally means to change in nature or essence. This is the amazing thing about salvation. I mean, this is this is the this the, the salvation experience in a person's life, the change that takes place when they accept Christ as their Lord is a miraculous thing. And and how do we know that? Because it's measurable. We see the change in a person's nature. We somebody, see somebody that goes from being one thing to a completely different thing, a different mindset, a different action, a different lifestyle. And all of us in this room that have served the Lord for a while can testify to this. Before we were saved, we were, we were riotous. We were, we were rebellious. We were wild. We were out of control. But then when we gave our hearts to Jesus, something changed, amen, inside of us. And even some of the things that maybe we've still been a little bit entangled in that we shouldn't be, we know that we ought not be entangled in those things anymore. That only comes from the Lord, amen? And so, and so we're to be transformed, which really means to be changed in essence. Christ's likeness is the, is the aim. Christ's likeness is transformation. That's the transformation we're looking for, is to be like Jesus. Uh, this quote says, victory begins, the, victory begins with the name of Jesus on our lips, but it will not be consummated until the nature of Jesus is in our heart. It begins with our, on our lips, right? We've got to confess the Lord. But the desire of the Lord is to work on the heart, to change the inner man, right? Praise God. And so, and so often we, we've, we've done this in even church. You know, I grew up in, a, in, a, in, a, in the church of God growing up in the South. And the church I grew up in was very, um, I would say, was, was borderline, if not a little bit legalistic. It was a lot about, even though the people loved the Lord, it was a lot about the outward appearance, right? And, we, and a lot of emphasis was put on the outward appearance. Here's what I know. If you change the inside, the outside will take care of itself. Too often we want to worry about what the outside looks, especially with new babes in Christ. We want to judge people by their appearance. We need to let the Holy Spirit do his work. That's a transformational thing that takes place. But what will happen is the outside is going to look different, amen, after a while. Praise the Lord. And so it's about the nature of Jesus in our heart. And once that happens, then, then we're, that christ likeness takes place. The nature of Christ is our goal, right? We want the nature of Christ. And we have a real adversary. And here's the reality. We are saved. We, we're, we're engaged in a struggle, but we have been brought out of darkness into the light. We have a real adversary, and that adversary is Satan. And he goes by several different names, many different names. Uh, the evil one, the accuser of the brethren. Uh, he goes by the deceiver, the liar, the murderer. He goes by so many different names, the serpent, the dragon, and so he has many names, but we know him often as, as Satan. But all of those things are parts, are descriptors of his character and his nature. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, amen. That's, 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 a, that's a characterization of his character, amen, of his nature. Uh, he is uh, the everlasting father, the Prince of Peace, the wonderful counselor, amen, the bright and morning star. And so we have this enemy that we fight, and Satan's domain is the realm of darkness, I'm going to do a little teaching today. It's going to be a little bit different today, but I'm going to do some teaching. Satan's domain is the realm of darkness. He operates in darkness. The devil is in darkness. Wherever there is spiritual darkness, there the devil will be. If there's spiritual darkness, there's where the devil will be. Uh, Jude chat, verse 6, Jude verse 6 says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. The devil and his fallen angels 
with him have been regulated to live in darkness. And that darkness is moral darkness. But that moral darkness will eventually and ultimately degenerate into literal darkness. And its, cause, and its cause is not simply the absence of light, but it's the absence of God who is light. And so wherever there is an absence of light, where there is moral darkness, it's because the, the light of God isn't in that place, and in that, in, that time, in, that, in that place morally in the heart and the life of an individual. Uh, Colossians 1 verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. Who? Christ Jesus has delivered every believer out of the domain or the authority of darkness or the authority of the enemy out of his camp and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We've been taken out of darkness into the marvelous light. When you were not saved and born again, you were in darkness. And your Lord was, was Satan. He was the master over your life and over your soul. And when God brought you out, he brought you out of underneath his authority and put you into his kingdom. And now you have a new authority over you. And that authority is Jesus Christ. Amen. That's, we need to make that really clear. We, when we've been born again, when we put our faith in Christ, it's because the Lord gave himself for us. We believed in him. We trusted him. And he brought us out of darkness. And now we are in his light and we are under the lordship of his kingdom. But... If we tolerate sin, we open ourselves up to satanic assault. As believers, you can be under satanic assault, but it, and it often happens because of the things that we tolerate in our life. Now, there'll be seasons when the enemy will come to try to, 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 to wreak havoc in our lives. And there'll be times when we're doing everything right and the enemy comes, just like Sister Brenda's talked about. He tries to, tries to discourage us or whisper lies or thoughts in our mind. But a lot of the assaults that happen in many believers' lives is self-inflicted because of the things that we tolerate. Um, whoever will be, who, listen to this, for, for whoever there, wherever there is willful disobedience, wherever there's willful disobedience to the word of God, there is spiritual darkness and the potential for demonic activity. To obey the truth and not do it. To know the truth and not is sin. And that opens the door for satanic activity in our life when there's willful disobedience. And so just to make the point clear, when Jesus was on the mountain in the wilderness being tempted, he had no sin in him. So Satan will come in moments like that to try us by the permission and will of God. And, and he has nothing in us if we're totally surrendered to Christ. But when we dis, when we willfully disobey God's word and the truth of God's word, then he has legal access to the areas of darkness in our, in our hearts. Amen. Let me say this real quick. The heart, if you can look at it in this way, the Bible refers to the heart as ground. The seed that was sown, some fell on the wayside and the birds, the fowls of the air came and they snatched it up. Some fell in the, in the thorny places and the weeds choked out, choked out the seed some fell on shallow ground and it sprouted up quick, but it had no roots and it dried up. But some fell on good soil and it produced some 30, 60, and 100 fold return. What is the, the, he's speaking of the heart, the heart's ground. And, and there's areas in our life as believers, when we get saved, the Lord redeems us and he brings us out of darkness. But there's areas in our life that have to be uh, totally surrendered to God. Areas that we may not even realize. Areas that were, were, were taken captive by the enemy, maybe through trauma in our life or through things that we've dealt with that we haven't given to God or, or undealt things that we've, we have in our life. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 20, 20 verse 27, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. Our spirit illuminated by the spirit of Christ becomes the lamp of the Lord through which he searches our heart. And so... The lamp of the Lord is in us. But watch this. Jesus says this. Luke chapter 11, verse 35. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. So how can we have the lamp of the light of the Lord in our spirit, but yet darkness could potentially be in us? When we harbor sin, the light in us is darkness. And we have to be careful. Satan has legal access given to him by God to dwell in the domain of darkness. The devil can traffic in any area of darkness, even the darkness that still exists in the Christian's heart. 
And I think this is the importance of us growing and maturing in our faith. We have to continually be growing. And I'm going to lay out some principles on how we can overcome these things because some of us have these strongholds in our life and we're aware of them because of the, of the, of the patterns in our life. The patterns in our life will tell us that there's something that's wrong, something's off. And all of us, every one of us, present company included, right? And sometimes there's things that they're strong. We don't even realize they're there because they've been there for so long. We just become so familiar and accustomed to them. It's just a part of who we are. And the Lord says, I don't want that to be a part of who you are. I want my nature to be a part of who you are. Is that good? All right. So uh, he can only traffic in any area. He can traffic in any area of darkness, even the darkness that exists in the Christian's heart. You know, there's a, I was thinking about this, and I remember reading this years ago, uh, um, uh, Rainer, uh, Rick Rainer, who wrote the book on, about spiritual warfare. We did a whole class on spiritual weapons. He wrote the book Dressed to Kill, which is an exhaustive a study on Ephesians 6, 10 through, I think, 18. And he talks about the armor of God, but one of the things he talks about, the wiles of the enemy. So we gotta be, be able to stand against the wiles, and that word translated means method of the enemy, strategies of the enemy. But he breaks it down even further. He said in its, it's, it's, in, in its root, in its root words, in its root form, the word literally means, it literally means uh, with the road. And what does it mean? The enemy is so knows exactly which, how he wants to attack us. He knows which avenues to get at us, which roads to take. The enemy's on a destination. And what is that destination? To kill, steal, and destroy. And so when we got to be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes, the enemy has a planned out. You don't go anywhere. Well, you might go somewhere without directions. You might, not, you might get there if you know where you're going. But if you've never been somewhere and you try to get there without directions, well, good luck. Good luck with that. I don't know what we did without cell phones. Man, I tell you, I don't know. Remember the old maps we used to stop beside the road and pull our maps out? And we'd have to take our finger and we'd have to try to find where we're at and... Man, it's dark outside and you can't find where you're at, you know? The enemy knows exactly what his target is. And he knows exactly the areas in our life that he can target because they've been exposed or been open to him. They're vulnerable. And so when he has access, he knows how to get there and he gets there quickly. Amen. You know, we used to say, my dad used to say this all the time. He says, uh, if people know where, if, how does it, how's that saying go? Uh, don't let people get you goat. If they know where your goat is, they'll get you goat, Right? Oh, hillbilly saying, right? Well, the devil knows where our goats are tied up, most of us. He knows our, he studied, he's a great, he's a great studier of human nature, right? Because he wants to destroy it. He wants to destroy mankind. He wants to destroy the image bearers of God. And so he studies and he knows and he knows the weaknesses of individuals. And that's why we got to be aware of his strategies. And so the areas where we get so tripped up in, we need to understand that the devil has access in that area in our life. That's why we get tripped up so easy. Amen. Uh, but God's got a plan. Look at somebody say, God's got a plan. God's got a plan. Now, I want to give you an example of what I'm trying to lay out to you, a biblical example of what I'm trying to lay to you. And we're going to talk about the life of Peter for just a second. And, uh, and God, God has a way of threshing the darkness out of us, right? And he has a thresher he uses to get the darkness out of us. Amen. I think you know where I'm going with this. Peter's denial of Jesus is an example for us to see how there was some carnal side of Peter left and the enemy had access to Peter to be able to do that. And let me just say this to you real quick. It wasn't human fear that caused Peter to deny Jesus. It was the pride in his heart. How do you know that, Pastor? Because, well, I can say, I'll just say this off before we get into the scripture. I can say this. I believe when Peter, if you know the story, when Peter told Jesus, he said, I'll go with you all the way. I'll die for you. I won't let nobody take your life. I'll die. I'll give my life for your life. When Peter was in the garden and he took the, she, the sword out of his sheath and he, he struck the servant of the high priest and he cut off of his ear, I believe Peter, as long as he could be in control, would fight to the very end. And what did Jesus say to Peter? He said, put away your sword. Hey, you, you, don't, you don't know the plan of God here. You only know what you think your, the plan of God is or you know what your plan is and what you want to do. And, and the Lord said, you got to put it away. And so when Peter could, had to give up control, what did he do? He ran in fear for his life. When he showed up on scene, what did he do? He lied and denied Jesus because he was fearful. But it wasn't fear alone that caused Peter to deny Jesus. I believe it was pride. Watch this. Pride gave the access to the enemy to strip Peter. And then what happens once we, once we fall, then the fear comes in and the enemy operates in fear, right? But it begins with pride. 
All right? Simon, Simon, Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 32. Jesus is in the upper room. He's about to go to the cross. And he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Behind the scenes, if you look at this for a second, Satan had demanded and received permission from who? The Lord to sift Peter like wheat. He demanded and he received it. Satan had access to an area of darkness in Peter's heart. How did Satan cause Peter's fall? After eating the Passover, you, you know, when we get, we're going to go to the Passover dinner here and we're going to see this picture. They're eating the Passover with Jesus. And Jesus says to these disciples after eating the Passover, says, one of you is a betrayer. And we go to Luke chapter 22, verse 23, and watch what happens. And they began to question one another, which of them could be who was going to do this? Now, can you imagine the shock for just a second? Here you are. You're with Jesus. You're his, you've been with him. for. Tw- you've given up everything for him for the last three, and a half, three, three years of your life. You've forsaken all these things, your careers, even family, and all those things to follow him. And he looks at you and he says, one of you in this group is a backstabber, is a betrayer. I mean, that would be a sobering moment, right? And so what do they do? Instead of looking and saying, could it be I, they start questioning each other. I don't know. Maybe it's you. I know it ain't me because I know know it couldn't have been me. It's got to be you. How do we know that? Because their questioning went from, they went from questioning one another to arguing over in the next verse, who was the greatest? A dispute arose among them. Verse 24, as to which of them was to, re, was to be regarded as the greatest. It couldn't be me because, man, when I prayed for that man out there over there in Bethany, he is, his sight returned. Well, that ain't nothing. Man, I delivered a lady and her three kids from demons. Amen. I, I'm, 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 I'm exaggerating there, but that, they had went out and they saw the hand of God working through their lives. And so automatically they begin to think more highly of themselves than they ought, that it couldn't be them that be the one to betray them. And so pride enters into the room and pride in Peter's heart. They went from an attitude of shock and dismay to an argument concerning who among them was the greatest. And because of pride in Peter's life, he was being set up. For the fall. What does the Bible say? Pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Pride precedes a fall. And here's the reality. Every one of us in this room have at some point in our life, if not dealing with it now, and if we're not careful, we'll have to deal with it in the future, is pride. It's the root cause of the fall. Satan desired to Exalt himself to be like God. And what did Jesus, what did the Bible say? Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. God will share his glory with none none other. And God ain't going to have a bunch of puffed up prideful kids either. Amen. And so Peter had opened the door to his pride. Satan's domain in darkness. Satan's domain is darkness. And when we have areas of darkness remaining in our heart, carnality He has the right to attack us there. Look at this. Jesus tells Peter this. Now listen to this. He says, Satan demanded to have you. It's a term of legality. I have the right to access there because I'm the prince of the power of the air. My domain is darkness. I have rights to access that area. He was given access because he had legal right. However, listen to Jesus' words. Now watch this. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Not if you turn back. See, let me tell you something. And I get this right now. The Lord desires that we walk in freedom in every area of our life. But if we're walking in any kind of carnality, the Lord will deal with that. And oftentimes he'll allow the enemy to have access so that he can work the things that he wants to work in our life. But watch what he says. But I've interceded for you, Peter. And I know how it's going to turn out. And you ain't going to like the process. And you probably can't see the full process in in play. 
And you're going to go through a moment of shame and disappointment and disgust because what you did. But when you've returned, when you got right back, when you've retraced your steps, when you've returned to the place from which you've fallen, strengthen your brethren. Because I've got a work for you to do, Peter. And, but there's some issues in your life that I need to get worked out. Let me tell you something. None of us have arrived. And we're not giving the devil any place or a, or, or a great uh, uh, applaud or a great making him bigger than what he is. He's, he's limited in scope and power. But we also have a responsibility. We have to be careful. I was reminded of this. I was reminded of this. And I got to move. But I was reminded of this. In the book of Joshua, chapter 1, Joshua gives, uh, God gives Joshua a command. My servant Moses is dead. Therefore, rise up. Go do what I've called, commanded you to do. And then he gives him this commandment to be very bold and courageous, to meditate on God's word. And if you do that, if you keep the word in your heart, hide it in your heart that you might not sin against me, keep your word, meditate on it day and night, then you will have success. Then you'll do what I've called you. You'll take the land. You'll be very successful. But only be bold and courageous. And when you fast forward and you look at the, 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 the nation of Israel as they make their journey into the promised land, they have these enemies that they have to fight, but there are three specific enemies that they have to fight. And the first one is Jericho. And Jericho always in the Old Testament, that represents a symbolic of the world. It's so big. It's so formidable. It's like we can't overcome it. It's impossible to defeat the world system. And yet God gave them power and authority to overcome the world system. But then he said to them, when you go and take the city, make sure you don't touch anything in that city because it's dedicated, it's devoted to destruction. It's devoted to me. And so when you put your hands on the things of the world, it's going to contaminate you, right? And so that was the first enemy they fought, and they went and they took that. But then they were sent in the camp because Achan went, and he, did the, he, did, he disobeyed the word of God, and the enemy was allowed to come in. And, and, but see, but it didn't show up. It didn't show up right away. It showed up in defeat. What do you mean, pastor? Achan's sin, Israel's disobedience didn't show up right away. It showed up in the next battle that they would face, and that's the battle of AI. And AI always in the Bible re represents the flesh, self-confidence, the ability to do it myself. What did they say? We don't need to send the whole army out. Just send a few up with us. It's a small camp. We can take them out in a minute. And they were routed, and 30-some men died and lost their lives. And they all come back to the camp of God, and they begin to weep and cry. And Joshua falls on his face and says, well, Lord, what happened? And he says, Joshua, get up. There's sin in the camp. And sin in our lives, undealt with sin, compromised sin, or, or the, or, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that, will allow for the enemy to be able to assault us and can bring defeat in our life. But God doesn't leave us there. He'll allow the defeat because he has a greater purpose to teach us something because he's trying to get us somewhere that he wants to take us. Amen. Praise God. But this thing is real, right? Satan demand, watch this. Okay, let me, Satan demand to have you, but I prayed for you. Uh, I want you to return. What the enemy means for evil, God means for good. We have to submit to God. This is the key to overcoming. Submit to God. The tripwire Satan used to cause Peter's fall was his own sin of pride. His tactics are the same today. We have to recognize before we do warfare, that there are areas, what areas we've hid in darkness, that we hide in darkness that are, and if we're not careful, when we, go, we engage in warfare and we wonder why we're walking in defeat because there's areas of darkness in our heart that we haven't dealt with and that will secure our future defeat. And this is, this, and this is very, I know this is, this is like, this is hoorah, hoop, hoopity doo, ah, jump and clap and run and shout and and those messages are here and they're coming, but sometimes the Lord needs us to understand. The disciples had all the hoop and holler that they could get leading up to the, the point of, G, of Peter's denial. They had all the moments of hype and the, all the moments of excitement. They saw the signs, wonders, and miracles. But the Lord said, but there's more I've got for you to do. And you don't understand it now. And there's going to come a moment where all of you are going to be scattered. But when you return, amen, there's going to come a moment where I've, because I've positioned you for greater, but I've got to deal with the things that you've allowed in your life that you're not willing to deal with yourself. Praise God. Praise God. Our first action to overcoming spiritual battles and defeats in life 
is simply repentance. How do we overcome defeats in our life? Well, listen, God is victorious, and I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loves me, gave his life for me. I'm not a victim. I'm not even a survivor. I'm an overcomer. But why are there, why are there defeats in my life? The Bible says in one place, examine yourself. Another place, Peter says, if you're going through something, first, make sure that it ain't because you, it's self-inflicted. You're not, you're, not being, you're not being persecuted or punished because of something you did. But if you've done everything right, then, be, then be, take joy because now you're suffering with Christ. Hardships are going to come, and that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about let a man examine his heart. And so that's what he's talking here. And he says to him that repentance is the first thing. If we'll be effective in spiritual warfare, we must discern our, discern our own hearts. Pastor Donzel said this the other day, and, the, and he was quoting scripture. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? Just follow your heart. No, don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Your heart will lead you to some bad places. Don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. Amen? Yield and surrender your heart to Jesus. First discern your heart. Then, first, then walk humbly but with God. And then you have to uh, take the course of action to submit to God. Then you res resist the devil and he has to flee. Watch this. Satan will never be given permission to destroy the saints. Rather, he is limited to sifting them like wheat. He has never, God will never give Satan permission to destroy you. But in the sifting process, he'll tell you God's forgotten about you and I've got you. How many has ever had the moment where the enemies try to tell you that this was the end, this was final? There's no hope beyond this. And yet God will not allow, have you considered my servant Job? Yeah, I considered him, but he's got all these blessings on his life. Remove the blessings, he'll curse you. Okay, I'm gonna allow you to remove the blessings, but don't touch his life. Blessings are gone, and guess what happens? Job remains, keeps his confession. He says, well, yeah, yeah, you took his possessions and those things from him, but touch his body. That's really, get to the, the, the issue of a man. Touch his own, his personal health and his personal comfort. Touch him where, he's, where the rubber meets the road. Take away his health. And the Lord says, go ahead, Job, but you can't, you can't kill him, you can't destroy him. Now, that seems harsh to us as, as believers. I mean, even me as a, as a Christian, that seems harsh that the Lord, and, 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 and the Lord's assessment of Job was this. Job is a perfect man in his days. There's none like him. But here's what we know, because if you read the story of Job, Job wasn't a perfect man. Job had fears in his life. He had things in his life that he was concerned about that the Lord had to get that out of him. Amen. And so, and, and so the Lord had to have him go through that. Just a real quick, just brief, and I'll get back to my notes here, but something you need to understand about the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord blessed Job double. He got back double everything that he lost. Job lost his, his, his livestock, his, his, his career, his, uh, what's the occupation, right? He lost his way, his livelihood. He lost his... Precious children, all 10 of them died in a, in a tornado. And then he loses his health, his own health. And, he, and his wife is so distraught. She says, won't you just curse God and die? Won't you just give up? Speaking from a place of despair and discouragement. Because she had lost so much too. And yet the Bible says that at the end of it, when he went through this long process, this horrible process, that the Bible says that the Lord blessed Job double. He got double back his cattle and sheep. He got double back. Everything he got back, he got double except for his children. Why didn't God give him back 20 kids? Because here's the reality. We don't live for e temporal. We live for eternity. Those other 10 kids were with the Lord. Amen. He had 10, he had 10 more that were here that would meet, have a reunion one day when they went to be with What's the point in saying all of that? No matter what we, we tend to look at the things that we go through as being so permanent that we can't see the greater glory that God has in mind for us and that the promises of God are yes and amen. And if we'll just trust the Lord in every area and let him work out of us the things that he wants to work out of us, we know that the reward is far greater than what we could ever attain in the temporal moment that we live in, in the present moment, amen. In the present 
Now watch this. Satan is only given to permission to sift us like wheat, and there's wheat inside each of us. What is the wheat? We're going to see what the wheat is. The wheat, what, what, what is sifting? I'm glad you asked. Sifting is to separate the pass. It's a separation by passing through a sieve or other straining device to separate the coarser elements. It's to, it's to remove the coarser elements from the finer elements. And God is trying to remove the coarseness of our life, the rough edges. That's why the process, uh, when the Lord is making us into that master, because he says we were created. We're his masterpiece, created for good works. The Lord is chiseling, like, 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 uh, like the, the great sculptor chiseling Michelangelo, making that, uh, that image of David. I mean, every detail, every just so masterfully. But the rough edges have to be knocked off, amen. The things have to be removed from our life. If we've got a problem with lying, God ain't going to let us keep in that, keep in that. A little white lie is still a lie. Amen. The Lord wants to remove the lie from our life and he'll allow us to be sifted to get the lies out of our life so that we'll be a person of truthfulness. If it's, if it's lust that we deal with, he's going to, he's, if we don't deal with it and let the Lord work that process, the enemy is going to have access to our life. Now, let me show you this. When we know we have a problem, repent right away and the Lord will come. He'll forgive and then he'll begin to work in our life. But if we don't deal with it, he'll use his thresher. And who's his thresher? That's the devil. That's important to understand, right? That's important to understand. And, and to sift is to shake violently. But aren't you glad to know that everything that can be shaken will be shaken? But what remains? The Lord remains, amen. I say this oftentimes. E.V. Hill, the great evangelist preacher said, I may tremble on the rock, but the rock don't tremble under me. Come on, somebody. I may tremble on the rock. Satan can't do anything that the Lord won't allow through his permissive will, right? And what is his purpose in this? To cleanse our soul from pride and to produce greater meekness and transparency in our lives. Next week, we're going to talk about the stronghold of humility. We're going to talk about that's going to be the message for next week. But right now, we're dealing with the issue of pride. And let me tell you something. We have to deal with it. It may be a terrible feeling to go through this, but God's got a good work in mind for it. Amen. What the enemy means for evil, God means for good. The husk-like outer nature must uh, die to facilitate the breaking forth of the wheat-like nature of the new creation man. God wants to bring out, and God can never entrust his kingdom to anyone who has not been broken of pride, for pride is the armor of darkness itself. And I didn't, I didn't quote that, but that's a good quote, ain't it? Pride is the armor of darkness itself. And what is the, what is the armor of light? It's humility. We'll see that next week. But the very armor of pride, why? Because it, it isolates us, insulates us from, from the truth of God. Pride does. Pride keeps us from receiving the blessings of God in our life because, anyway, I'll leave it at that. I'm not just going to say something else, but I don't even know what to say at that. That's, a, that's, a, that's enough said. I'll just drop the mic right there. Praise God. Watch this. Peter's husk nature was presumptuous and proud. His initial success had been made, uh, made him ambitious and self-oriented. You look at them, study the life of the disciples, and you see that. They were all ambitious. And they were, and they were motivated and self-oriented, and it was all about who was the greatest. And Satan demanded permission to assault Peter, and Jesus said, to effect, you can sift him, but you can't destroy him. Go ahead, you have access, but listen, you won't destroy his life. And I think the enemy, and I don't know this for sure, because the enemy is the enemy is not all knowing. He doesn't know the future. He's he only knows in part. He he he's an expert in the past. He's an expert at using the past to manipulate our present to convince us of a future that he doesn't even know about. To convince us of a future that we don't that's not true. But if we buy into the lie, then that future will become reality. Now, which makes the enemy look like he knows the future, but he don't know the future. All he does is manipulate us to believe what he said. And so we just become a puppet in his hand to do the thing that he wants us to do. And yet the Bible says we got to submit to God and resist the devil. And then he's got to flee, right? All right, I'm almost there. Come on, Daryl. I've got a lot more notes, but that's all right. Come on, Daryl. Is this okay? Listen, I have been praying this as I've been preach, uh, studying this word and just been meditating on this, I have been praying, oh, Lord, show me my blind spots. 
Show me the errors in my life that I might not realize. And the things that I do know, God, give me such conviction to deal with those and not, not resist you anymore. Lord, break down the wall, the barrier, the armor of pride in my life. Break it down, God. Break it apart. Satan knows how to attack. Praise God. And we're not capable of resisting him in ourselves. I'm going to get ahead of myself. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. The warfare against Peter was devastating and measured, but it served God's purpose for Peter's life. It served God's purpose for Peter's life. Praise God. Now watch this. The greatest defense we can have against the devil is to maintain an honest heart before God. And that reminded me of a story in the Old Testament. And I, I remember reading this years ago. King David, he's an incredible figure in the Bible. He's a man of, he's kind of a, he's kind of a man of, it's just, there's, just this incredible, just incredible about his life. And so the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. He was in the field as a shepherd boy, forgotten by his daddy, kind of overlooked by his parents, his family, his brothers. He was the, he was the youngest son, and, and yet the Lord put his hand on David's life, anointed him as king as a, as a young man, and long before he ever took kingship, David was serving the Lord, had a heart for God, and God would take David through a process to develop him to become king, and David would come into the promises of God, and he would receive everything that God said, and he would be the greatest king that Israel ever had. King David, from his lineage, would come Jesus Christ, the, the, our Redeemer and Savior through the bloodline of David, and so David had all these, God said, I'll establish your throne forever, David, and he does that through Jesus Christ. But David was a man after God's own heart, but David also was a man that had confliction in his heart. He was a man that sinned at times, a man that gave into his own passions at times. And later on in David's life, after he had done so many things, good and some things not so good, he's in a situation where his family, he's under attack by one of, in his own household, his son Absalom, who betrays David and tries to take the throne from David. David, uh, desiring not to bring the people of God into a war in the city and many lives being lost, takes his, his circle, his, his counselors and his people and his wives and children, and he leaves Jerusalem and he goes into the wilderness and he marches into the wilderness so that he can get away from the city so that there will be endless deaths and killings there. And the Bible says while he's making his way up the mountain, uh, the valley or the Kidron Valley, there's a man by the name of Shimei who happens to be a relative of Saul, King Saul, who David replaced. King Saul had a wicked heart and God removed King Saul and gave David the throne. And so Shimei, who happens to be a relative of King Saul, sees David in his distress and begins to pelt him with rocks and his people with rocks saying, you're a murderer. You stole your father's, you stole your master's house. You're a surplanter. You deserve what you're getting. And David's, David's, one of David's mighty men in one of his armor verse says, let me go over there right now. And I, within, a, within a drop of a hat my vernacular, I'll take his head off from his shoulders. I'll drop him right where he is in, right now. He won't have another breath to make one more accusation. And David says, leave him alone. It could be that God is speaking through him. And I thought about that because that's just kind of, and maybe, and then David says something so amazing. He says, maybe the Lord will show, maybe the Lord will see what's going on and maybe the Lord will show us his mercy. Well, what, why do I even bring that story? And how does that even relate to this? That we need to keep an honest heart before God. Guess what? The Bible says in one, another place, agree with your accuser quickly. Why? Because if something is true, don't try to deny it and defend yourself. The enemy can't have anything over you. He operates in darkness and deception. And if you'll just confess the truth, he has that no power over your life in that area. And David was a murderer. He wasn't the, this is what the enemy do. The enemy will accuse you of things that you didn't even do, but, but some of the things that you did kind of associate with the things he's accusing you of doing. David never took his, his master's throne, but he took another man's wife and he had him killed. And David was honest before the Lord. And the Bible says that, that God brought David back into the kingdom, but he had to go through some things. I, where am I at here? Where am I at? Let's see. Praise God. I want to get there. I'm almost there. Okay. 
When the Holy Spirit shows us an area that needs repentance, we must overcome the instinct to defend ourselves. And how many of you have ever lawyered up when, when the Holy Spirit was trying to convict you of something? I mean, we've all done it, right? How many of you have ever compared your faults to the faults of somebody else? Yeah, mine wasn't so good, but his was a whole lot worse. The devil is a liar. I'm going to tell you another lie of the enemy. Man, David was a man after God's own heart. And man, and he, but yeah, he did all these things, but he was still a man after God's own heart. I haven't done no words nearly as bad as David. So that thing I'm watching, I shouldn't be watching. At least I didn't take another man's wife. That's a lie from the enemy. That sin is just egregious to God is the one that David committed. And for the believer to defend themselves is, 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 is yes, gross pride. Praise God. For us to succeed in warfare at our self-preservation instincts must be submitted to the Lord Jesus. That was Peter's issue in the garden. It was self-preservation. He wasn't just fighting for Jesus. He was fighting for his place at Jesus' side. Because if Jesus dies, then I can't be at his right hand. I can't sit on thrones when he rules in the kingdom. What's this look like for me? I mean, I've had a, I've had, I've had a 10-year, a 5-year plan here with Jesus. I've suffered in the wilderness. I've slept on the ground. I've, I've given up my comfort and my convenience to follow this man. Now he's going to give up his life so freely. I've got too much invested. I'm going to, I'm going to lay it all out here on the line. Come here, buddy. I'm going to whack your head off. And Jesus says, put it away, Peter. Put it away. You don't know the things of the Lord. Your heart's full of pride. Put it away. Satan is the accuser, but Christ is our advocate. Satan may accuse us, and we just need to be honest before God, but know that we have one that goes before us that advocates on our behalf. Watch this. How do we engage in spiritual battle? By embracing this knowledge. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And we need that, man. We need that so desperately in the hour we live. We need to walk in humility. So many of us have opinions about things, and they're just opinions. And at the end of the day, they don't mean anything. And we take our ground, and we take our position, and we stand our ground on our heels that we were willing to die on. And at the end of the day, they don't mean anything, and we lose relationships over that. We lose our peace over that. We lose our joy over that. The Lord wants to remove those things from our life. Amen. To live is Christ, to die is gain. It doesn't matter. We have, we're winners either way. Amen, amen, amen. The political season is coming up. And in 2020, man, I bought the hook, I bought the bait, hook, line, and sinker. And I still have strong convictions about things. If you're going to vote, vote biblically. Don't vote based upon a personality. Vote based upon the Word of God. Look at what the party stand for. But let me tell you something. At the end of the day, those things are all fading away. Don't lose your peace over that. If your man or your woman don't get elected, don't lose your peace over that. God's still on the throne. Trust the Lord. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he's got to flee. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Isn't that music soothing? It just comforts you, doesn't it? I told you I had to get a new way of joke. <laughs> uh, watch this. I'm all listen, listen to this. James 4, 6. God is opposed to the proud, gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud. And if we are, and if we are too proud to admit that we're wrong, then God is opposed to us. What in the world? But I'm God's favorite son. God would oppose me. Best thing my dad ever did to me, the best thing my mom and dad ever did to me was when I was wrong, they told me I was wrong. The worst thing you can do for your kids is let them think they're right about everything. Because they ain't right about a whole lot, especially when they're little. And if you don't teach them when they're young, humility, they'll grow up prideful and they'll be a terror for everybody around them. Amen. And the best thing that God does is he won't let us operate in pride, but he has a way of humbling his children. He has a way of bringing us low so that he can exalt us high. Amen. Pride precedes the fall, but humility precedes the exaltation. God wants to lift his people up. Seated in heavenly places. 
But he's not going to give us something we can't, we, we're not responsible enough to, to maintain. So he's got to work out of us the things that are going to be detrimental to us uh, for doing the things that he's called us to do and maintaining what he's called, given us to do it with. Amen. Praise God. Okay. Come on, Chris. You got to go. Here you go. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. He has to flee. What causes Satan to flee from us is repentance, humility, and possessing a clean heart. David said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. David was a believer. And he was saying, he believed in the Lord. He said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Cleansing of the word, washing of the word, amen, in his heart. Honest confession. Lord, I am a sinner, but Lord, I know you're a savior. Lord, I know you've forgiven me, Lord, but I'm saying forgive me again, God, because I've blown it this time. And the Lord doesn't say, well, I'll, you've got to do this and this and this, and then maybe I'll give you a... No, he says, oh, son, oh, daughter, all I wanted you to do was just own it. Just confess it. To say what I already know. And don't try to defend yourself. Because I don't want the enemy to have access in areas in your life. Is this all right? Victory begins with the name of Jesus on our lips, but it will not be consummated until the nature of Jesus is in our hearts. Christ's likeness is God's answer to combat Satan. Satan in, the, Satan in the areas of weakness has no place in us if we're like Jesus. What did Jesus say? The God of this world has nothing in me. Why? Because Jesus had no darkness in him. But if there's darkness in our heart, we have give the enemy opportunity. Open doors. Open doors. And it begins with pride because we need to, we need to realize that and be honest before the Lord. I'm not saying confess something that's not true. You don't have a problem with these areas, and you are living for the life. You're and you're maturing in your faith. Rejoice in that, but always be on your guard. That's why the Bible says, "Be sober-minded, for your adversary, the devil, roams around." Don't get prideful. Don't slip. Don't lose your place. Don't get distracted because you're doing good. Doesn't mean you're going to always do good because he's looking for access points anywhere he can get them. If the access point is a, is, a, is a relationship you're in, break it off. If it's a show you're watching, break it off. If it's a conversation you're having, break it. Don't give him any access to your life, to your mind. Because all he wants to do is destroy, to wreak havoc. Christ's likeness is the aim. Satan will not continue to assault you if the circumstances he's designed to destroy you are now working to perfect you. He'll learn that area. I can't work in his life no more in that area. Let me tell you something. Anxiety was a, a, a devil had a foothold in my life through fear. I've shared this story and I'm going to make it really brief. All my life, Brandon, I was a weird kid. Ask my mom. She's got pictures of me. When I was in like kindergarten. And it all started because of a trauma that was, that was and I, I call it a trauma that was enacted on my life from a relative that they didn't even realize they did it because they thought it was funny. But they brought fear into my life by telling me that if I touched certain things as a child, a four or five year old kid, that I was going to die. I remember touching a butterfly, grabbing a butterfly one time. And my aunt and my cousin said, you didn't, what color was it? Did it have yellow spots on it? Oh, yeah, it did. Was it, did it have black, blue, too? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. You didn't touch that one, did you? I, I mean, it's, it's funny now. Five, I remember I went into my mom's bedroom. They did, my mom and dad didn't know this was going on because I didn't know how to communicate that to them. I just believed I was going to die. I went into my mom's bedroom, got on the floor, and I said, all right, I'm just waiting to die. <laughs> About five minutes later, I wasn't dead. I got up. <laughs> if it would have stopped there, that would have been Okay. But it created in me, a, and I was thinking about this, and I, I think I could trace this back to that. It created in me an anxiety and a fear. So anything that I touched as a child, I thought I got to get it off of me. So my mom, you remember I used to do this all the time. I'd walk around. I was in the, I was in the kindergarten graduation doing this. Up there, and my mom's probably thinking, I got a weird kid. I got a weird kid. I'm blowing the germs off my hands. Every time I got dirty, I'd go take a bath because I didn't want nothing on me that would kill me. I outgrew that stage, but that anxiety, that stronghold that the enemy had in my life stayed, and it, it, it just morphed into other things. Fears of being alone and not having anybody in my life. 
fears of uh, being rejected and no one loving me or caring for it, whatever it was, fears of not being able to make, a, make it in this world. And it came to a head. I had to go through the valley of the shadow of death. I had to have a Red Sea experience. Because the Lord said, that thing that's in you, I'm going to kill it. You're not, not going to buy Listen, I don't battle with anxiety anymore. I spent the night in the ER back in December. That was miserable. Listen, I went to my doctor. He checked my heart. He's had your regular EKG. I had good dinner dates with my good friends up here. We was going to go get us a big old steak from Lucky Steakhouse. And the doctor said, you can't do that. you got to go to the ER right away. They got better equipment over there. I went over there. They checked me out. I said, we're going to keep you for observation. We're going to put you in a room. Liars. They didn't put me in a room. I slept on a chair about this big. Six o'clock in the morning. I'm all curled up in the fetal position. This guy's coming here checking my wrist, man. I, it was horrible. But you know, through that whole process, I never had anxiety one time about it. Why can I, what am I saying to you right now? Peter dealt with, God dealt with Peter's pride. Watch, watch this. I'm, I'm going to jump ahead of myself here, but I want to show you something. God had to get the pride out of Peter. God wanted Peter to have victory in his life. He allowed Satan to sift him because there was an open door that Peter hadn't dealt with. Fast forward, Peter gets it right. God does the work after the sifting and after he's returned. And he now he's stringing his brother on the day of Pentecost. The Bible says they were all in one place and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Fast forward to chapter 4, verse uh, 13, chapter 3, verse 12. Peter's addressing the people after a healing has taken place, a miracle. He says, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? And, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Peter had this, this thing that was in Peter's life and now gone. Why? Because the Lord moved it out of his life. Amen. And what we see now, Peter went from a place of like being the greatest to now, why are you looking at me? I ain't got nothing in me that's any good. It's only God can do these things. Amen. And that's the place God wants us to be at as his children. Amen. Praise God. And we've got to be careful because the enemy wants to have access to our minds that he might just convince us of things that aren't true. Praise God. The darkness in Peter's life was displaced with light, and the pride in Peter's life was replaced with Christ. Christ was humble. Let this mind be which in you, which was also in Christ. The battlefield is the mind, and to be victorious on the battlefield, we need to have the mind of Christ. In every area in our life, I, I hope that I've communicated this well. In my mind, and my heart, I've, uh, I've tried. We're not victims. But we walk in defeat too often because we give the enemy access to areas that he, does, he shouldn't have the right to. But he does because we've opened the door to the, him to have the right in those areas. And when we begin to close those doors, when we begin to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus, we're going to start being like Jesus. Be imitators of God, little children. Father, I love you. Father, I thank you. Lord, there's therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed us from the law of sin and death. Condemnation might be a stronghold in somebody's life today. The enemy's convinced you that your past still means something. And the only thing that your past means today is you've got a great testimony of God's faithfulness and goodness. That's the only thing your past means today. Not that you're a horrible person, not that you did horrible things, but that God is a good Savior and He can redeem the what He can redeem and restore what the locusts has eaten. That's what that your past means. Amen. And I speak against the, the stronghold of condemnation in the name of Jesus. If you've submitted your heart to Christ and you love the Lord, the enemy has no right to be efficient in your past. Amen. But let me say this to you right now. If trauma, past hurts and abuse 
have caused you to have a stronghold of unforgiveness in your heart and in your life, today is the day to get rid of that stronghold because it's held you captive too long and it's affected your life too bad and it's messed you up too much, amen, and it's made you ineffective in living a life of full peace and joy in the Lord because every time you feel like you're just about to get it right, that my mind, your mind goes back to that offense and it just takes captures your heart and the enemy just shuts the door again and you don't see yourself ever getting free from that, but you can be free today. Come on, just on it right now. Yes, I was wounded, but God, you're able to forgive through me. You're able to save that person. God, I forgive them. Now forgive them through me, God. And let it go. Let go of whatever the stronghold is. The, en the enemy operates in darkness. And anything that we keep in secret and we even try to keep it from God because the Lord already knows then the enemy will have access to continue to operate in that area in our life keeping us ashamed keeping us feeling guiltful and not allowing us to move into the, the good things that God has for us but you tear down a stronghold sometimes you got to tear it brick by brick down but God has given us weapons to defeat the enemy what are some of those weapons it's praise it's praise. When you give God praise in everything, it's prayer. It's prayer. It's, it's confessing and praying. It's not just asking, but it's also reminding God of what his word says and reminding the enemy of what God's word says. It's prayer. It's praying for those who falsely and wrongly do you. There's many weapons in our arsenal. Humility is your greatest weapon in your arsenal because it starts with humility. You know, one of the lies the enemy tells people is like, I can never overcome this. That's right. Agree with the enemy. You're right. It's, I never can overcome this in myself. But with God, all things are possible. <laughs> You're right, I don't have the strength and ability to overcome this. I can't forgive, I can't love, I can't forget. Yeah, but with God, all things are possible. Only God. <laughs> Only God. <laughs> You're going to sing, we're just going to examine our hearts. Oh, Jesus. Jesus.